Uh, this is Erin. He is the outreach coordinator from the Perkins Trail and Talking Book Library. And I'm just going to hand it over to you, Erin. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Please. Before I, I hand it over, just a quick housekeeping thing. Uh, if you need any restrooms, there are one on this floor and three downstairs. And there are water fountains as well. Thank you. That was a wonderful introduction. Um, okay, well, I am so happy to be here, guys. Uh, my name is Aaron Pertigola. I work at the Perkins Braille and Talking Book Library in Watertown, Massachusetts. Um, I'd like to start off with a couple of questions for you guys. Um, so I'm sure you weren't expecting to have this uh, interactive kind of event. A uh, quick show of hands. How many of you have ever heard of the Perkins Library? Excellent. All right, most hands are coming up. How many have ever heard of the Perkins School for the Blind? All right, more hands went up for that one. How many of you knew that there was a difference between the two? Only a couple of people. Okay, great. So this is why we do these kind of fact-finding missions. So there is a difference indeed between the Perkins Library and the Perkins School for the Blind. So another question for you all. How many have ever heard the Library of Congress? All right, a lot of people have put their hands up for that one. So the Library of Congress actually has a special division which handles people who have what's referred to as print disabilities. That's the catch-all term. Uh, the Library of Congress uh, service is known as the National Library Service. So we are part of that. We are Massachusetts Regional NLS Library. Every state in the country has at least one NLS library. That's great. We got the, it's, it's on. Uh, so everyone has at least one. In Massachusetts, we actually have two. One of them is located in Watertown, and that is our library. And the other one is our sister library, which is located in Worcester. Um, most of our patrons don't really need to know all that much about it. Um, however, the, uh, the, the Worcester Library is where the large print materials are housed and our Watertown location is where most other materials would come from. So what are those materials? Well, we're going to discuss a couple of different things here. We're going to talk about things that the library is currently doing, the things that the library has done in the past, and what we hope to be able to do in the future. So I hope everyone's ready. We're going to cover a lot of different things. Um, first and foremost, our library is designed to help provide accessible materials to people um, that can be represented in a number of different ways in a number of different formats. This item right here, um, and you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pass this along to you. So if you want to, it's okay. Take a look at it, hand it around. Um, what I'm going to discuss with you guys is reimagining outreach remote access activities for the information desert. How many have ever heard of an information desert? Excellent, excellent. So, uh, how many have ever heard of the term digital divide? All right, excellent. I'm guessing you guys are librarians in the back. Okay, yeah. There's a lot of terms that you guys are well familiar with. For those of you who may not already be familiar with these terms, uh, digital divide is essentially anyone who experiences an inability or a difficulty in accessing digital content. And that could be because of many different reasons. So, for example, somebody could be living in an area where it's too remote and they don't have access to high speed or internet access. You could have someone who has a disability and internet access is just not within their wheelhouse. You could have a senior citizen and they're just not comfortable using computers um, or have internet connection at home. So it's a catch-all term to incl include a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. Seniors specifically, there's another term that's often used and that's the gray divide. So very similar to the digital divide, you have the gray divide. And that specifically is earmarked towards people who are older, senior citizens that may not be comfortable using internet access. Um, so I can give you a couple of stories and examples. I love this one right here. I think this is such an important illustration that really highlights what our library and what we as a nation really hope to represent. So for anyone who can't see the screen, I'll describe it. This is a cartoon. Um, it's outside of a school. The steps outside of the school are covered in snow. There's a gentleman who's standing on those steps and he's shoveling off the steps. To the left of those steps is a wheelchair ramp. There are a bunch of students on the bottom and there's one student in a wheelchair. And the student in the wheelchair asks the man shoveling the steps, could you please shovel the ramp? The man says back to the student in the wheelchair, all these other kids are waiting to use the stairs. When I get through shoveling them off, then I will clear the ramp for you. The kid below that says, but if you cover the ramp, we can all get it. And that's the important point that I think a lot of people miss. Clearing a path for people with special needs clears a path for everyone. When you plan for accessibility, then you're planning for everyone. If accessibility is an afterthought, then you've A, ignored the needs of your community, but B, you've made it more difficult now to reach those people. Because now we have to think after the fact. After we've already built the, st the structure, after we've already built the entrance of the building, now is when we start thinking about a wheelchair ramp. That's not the right time. 
The right time is during the planning phase. So being aware of needs of your community is the most paramount thing that we can do. And as information professionals, as people are providing for your community, that's what we want to be able to do. We want to provide the best services for the most number of people. And in doing so, uh, this is what we aim to provide. Did anyone uh, that wanted to see this player get a chance to see the player? Uh, uh, many of you may already be familiar with this. This is the standard talking book player that our library lends out to patrons who are eligible for our services. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, but let's continue on though. This is an image of a woman. Um, I find this to be a very powerful image. Um, when COVID happened, there were a lot of people in our community that were already um, rather isolated uh, for whatever the reason, because uh, they were comfortable being at home, it was easy for them to be at home, but whatever it may have been, I had a lot of conversations with people who said to me, I only saw a few number of people during my month, and now those people are not allowed inside my home. What am I going to do? How am I supposed to get through this? What, what, is, what is an option for me that's available? There were a lot of libraries, a lot of information uh, providers that um, said, we're going to move these programs online. We're going to take the book group, and here's a URL, here's a fancy QR code, here are uh, links to Libby, here are open, uh, 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 readily available titles that are uh, open to the public. We can continue, like nothing's changed. But then you had a lot of seniors that that really wasn't something they were comfortable with. And you had a population which were perhaps at most need of these kind of services who were essentially being cut off from that because it was not a consideration. Accessibility was not something that was being uh, uh, discussed. What is the Perkins Library? Uh, we are a regional library for the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled, or the NLS. As I mentioned, we are the regional. There is a sub-regional in Massachusetts, um, but we are fortunate to have two. Uh, it is also a free and accessible library service for people with temporary or permanent low vision, blindness, or a physical disability that prevents them from reading or holding the printed page. This is a defined term. There are many different ways that someone may be eligible, um, but it's important that people understand like, what the Library of Congress defines and how we use that information is important to understand. Uh, there is a rather long definition that explains exactly who is eligible. Essentially, the way that I describe it, does someone have a difficult time holding a book and turning pages and reading comfortably? And that could be for any number of reasons. The number one reason in Massachusetts for someone to be eligible for our services is because of vision loss. That is the number one reason, specifically age-related vision loss. So the bulk of our patronage, the most people that are using our services, they're seniors, they're older people, and there's nothing wrong with that. We want to be able to provide for that. Um, the sad reality of what it is that we do, um, we tend to be an end of life service. We're proud of that. We are very proud of that. But most people that are part of our library, they are with us for a fairly long time until the very end. And we want to be able to continue to provide for people uh, well into maturity. So no matter what that may look, age is just a number. But if you like reading, there's no reason to stop. And that's where we come in. We're the state's main provider of accessible library resources for eligible residents and institutions. This is the important part. Um, not only can individuals get access to this resource, but also institutions. So libraries, hospitals, nursing homes, rehabilitation centers, uh, schools, tons of different organizations. If you have a population who would have difficulty reading print, they can get free services through us. This is huge. Uh, quick show of hands. How many of you know someone who has dyslexia? Ooh, goodness. All right. Yes, that is an, a, 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 a realistic and alarming and unfortunate number of people that have raised their hands. I always say if I could snap my fingers tomorrow and say that we don't need to exist, I would. We can't do that. We're not there yet. So we're working on these things, but there always seems to be uh, populations who are in need that perhaps are not getting addressed as best as they could. Uh, individuals who have dyslexia. About two years ago in October, the federal law was updated to um, uh, better represent the changing times. Um, there had been at one point in time, anyone who was eligible because of dyslexia, so let's say there was a student, that student would need to provide a diagnosis in order to get access to our collection. That, however, would require funding. So if a school district, if, if a teacher believed that one of her students had dyslexia, she could approach the school district, she could approach the parents, they can work at an IEP, they could do a lot of different things, but who's going to cover the cost for the diagnosis? If the school district could not cover it, then that cost would fall upon the parents. If the parents could not cover it, then that student could very well fall between the cracks. So someone who would benefit by having access to uh, uh, resources that would make reading more uh, accessible to them, 
they would need to jump through a series of hoops that would prove, in many cases, difficult if not impossible for many people. So we changed the law and now more than ever are people able to get signed up. And dyslexia, you only now need to be a teacher or someone on, uh, in a scholastic setting. So that is really what the requirement is now. So for those of you who raised your hand, uh, it might be worthwhile to mention that to someone that you know in your life. Did you know that the Perkins Library provides resources specifically um, detailed towards people who have print disabilities and that includes uh, dyslexia and other reading disabilities? Um, Ma'am, did you have a, your hand up? Did you want to ask I something? I the state would pay for the testing for dyslexia, would they? Um, I, to be honest with you, I don't work for the school districts. All yeah. that I can tell you is what has been reported to me and I've okay. spoken to a number of teachers who have said to me that this is a resolution to a long-standing problem. Oh, good. So, um, this is, a, this is a reality that we often deal with is that somebody should be paying for this. You're absolutely right, someone should be. Hopefully, but it's not always the case. Yep. And what I have seen from people is that there is a very good reason why this legislation was passed. Perhaps not in Massachusetts, perhaps we have made accommodation for that. I've not heard that specifically though to this point, but I do know on a federal level though, this was a necessary need. So. Uh, but again, I don't work for the school districts. I don't like to speak about things that I don't know enough about. Usually if I don't know an answer, I'll refer someone else to someone who may. But you can always call the library though if you want to learn more about that. Okay. Uh, what I can tell you is that the original purpose of our NLS library was to help veterans who had lost their war during uh, World War I due to chemical warfare. It was a very small percentage of people that were actually eligible for these services. We had more and more people raising their hands saying, I don't quite qualify. I was born without my, my vision. Um, I lost my vision later on in life due to uh, an accident. There are many reasons why someone would be eligible beyond what was initially intended. So as more and more people started raising their hand, we started changing those rules. So I often advise people, if ever you're having difficulty, if you're not sure if you're eligible, contact us, get in touch with us because we wanna be able to provide for those individuals. And sometimes it just needs us to understand more. I had a person that um, recently um, they had submitted an application to us because of hearing loss. My first in initial thought was that, well, that's not really a reason for eligibility. Let me contact the person who submitted the application and get a little bit more backing on this. Let me get a little bit more understanding. After I understood what this particular person's condition was and after I spoke with their medical provider, the person who had signed the application, I realized that yes, absolutely, this person's eligible because their form of hearing loss, their condition did impact their way to read. So because of that, then that's all that we need. So we just need to be able to verify whether someone is in or is not eligible based upon certain criteria. So, um, but we're here to help answer questions. So if ever anyone feels that they should be eligible but they're not quite sure, contact us. Um, one of the things that we created at the onset, we talked a little bit about um, loneliness and isolation. The um, American uh, US uh, Surgeon General recently released a report saying that loneliness and isolation are the number one issue plaguing Americans today. Um, during COVID, there were a lot of people that were cut off, and even today, there's a lot of people that may still not feel as connected to the community as they once had. So what are ways that we can change that? What are ways that we can help and uh, bridge those connections with people? Um, the telephone program uh, is developing technologies where uh, we're leveraged to create a range of new programs for our community to engage with from the safety and comfort of their homes, either over the phone or over the internet. Um, I don't want to put anyone on the spot here, but there are a lot of people who have internet access. There are a lot more people who don't have internet access and uh, have a telephone. I shouldn't say a lot more. There are a lot of people who don't have internet access but do have a telephone. A telephone is a more ubiquitous tool than a computer for a lot of reasons. So for those individuals who wanted to stay connected to their community and did not have internet access, did not have a computer and were not able to join the myriad of programs that are available, there are a lot of programs that are on Zoom. We created the telephone program because it's accessible over the phone. I do a lot of outreach um, for a lot of different organizations and one of the concerns that people have is how can people access information? What is an accessible format to them? Print is accessible. Large print is accessible. Some people may not be able to read large print or be able to read print at all. So print is not always accessible. Audio materials typically are more accessible but some people may have hearing loss. So the important thing to realize is that nothing is ever 100% accessible for 100% of the people. I'll give you an example of this. Um, in Massachusetts, when um, they were releasing um, the registration for the COVID vaccination, um, we actually had to advocate with the state to figure out what to do because there were a lot of people that um, could not access the website. That was Massachusetts' catch-all solution. Don't worry, 
We've got a website, just go on here, there's a URL, register for your vaccine, you'll be taken care of. The reality though is that the, the, the largest portion of people in Massachusetts who did not have internet access were seniors, and seniors was the largest population that, were, um, uh, uh, that, that people hoped to have receiving the, uh, the vaccine. So it created a very interesting problem where the people that were in most need of it had no real logical way of registering for it. So we went to the state and we said, listen, we appreciate the effort, but we need to do a little bit more here. What the state did, which was gracious in their, in their regard, but perhaps a little bit short-sighted, but they released a telephone number. So anyone who could not access the computer internet re uh, resolution were able to go on the telephone resolution. The problem though is that they didn't do enough of a job to explain to people that this is not meant if you can register online. So you had a lot of people in this state, people who are registered online already saying, well, I can also call up. Well, if I'm registered at both of them, then I'll get seen before anyone, right? Like that makes absolute sense. No, it didn't, it, it was terrible. What essentially it did is that created a bottleneck for people who otherwise were not able to register for this event. I had one of my library patrons, she's 96, don't tell her I said that, um, but she was, on hold for four hours trying to get registered so she can get her vaccine. That was unfortunate. Now, again, the state, I'm very grateful for what they did. That was kind of them to be aware and to make those accommodations, but there are a lot of people that may not realize what it is that we're trying to do and what can make things accessible or inaccessible. So everyone being here today and discussing this, this is really helpful. This is gonna do a lot of good. Um, so the telephone program also, it's a regularly scheduled weekly programs known as telephone activities, which include trivia, audio described films, yoga, musical performances, and radio plays, among many others. We've got a ton of programs, um, as well as local authors, lecturers, and agency representatives. These are all programs which are made available over the phone. So for anyone who can join over the internet, they're absolutely welcome to. That's also an option. But for anyone who cannot, they can also join us over the phone. Now, are we doing anything special? Not really. Anyone could do this. Literally anyone could do this. But are people doing it? No. And not as many as what they should be. So bringing awareness to what the differing needs of the community uh, may be is paramount. This is crucial that we are discussing, we're understanding, we're talking about these things. We are sharing stories and experiences because there may be a lot of people, maybe even people in your own community who don't have the ability to express that they're experiencing these difficulties. The telephone program is also accessible to people without computer or internet access. This was the key point of creating this program, was that recognizing that there are people who are limited in accessing material uh, in a digital format. Uh, what we try to do, one of the programs is that we take digital material, material that's only available online, and we rebroadcast, or as the, the colloquial term that we use is resume, right? It's a little, little confusing though, but yeah, we resume content, which would be otherwise only available online. So for example, one of my favorite programs is um, old time radio. We take radio dramas and we will rebroadcast them. And what people don't realize is that that is inherently accessible. You don't need to be able to see in order to enjoy somebody doing a radio program because it's all audible. It's all in your imagination. So regardless whether someone has some vision, no vision, partial vision, doesn't matter. They're all on the same page. They're all enjoying it. Same thing with the movies. We have audio described DVDs that we would play uh, on, uh, over, the, over the telephone. So whether someone can see the screen, uh, cannot see the screen, or can see the screen a little bit, it doesn't matter. It's the same experience that everyone's all enjoying at the same time. Yes, ma'am? When you say over the telephone, would that include like flip phones and phones that are not smartphones? Correct, yes. Any, so that's a great point. That is a phenomenal point. Um, Zoom is available over smartphones as well. There's an app that you can install. Again, for someone who has, I've heard people call it the dumb phone, which I think is a little, little uh, uh, comical. Um, but if you have a traditional flip phone, there are no apps that you can just install to connect. You can call into programs. So that's an excellent point. Um, and part of the reason why it's available just to dial in is because of the accessibility. It's far easier. Yeah. Good question. Uh, essentially, yes. You would have to be, uh, the way that we define it is you have to be part of our NLS library. I do have members of certain groups who are outside. I'm sorry? You couldn't hear the question. Oh, sorry, excuse me. Um, do people need to be part of the Perkins Library to be part of the telephone programs? Um, essentially, yes. So we have people who are outside of Massachusetts who do call in, but they are part of the NLS and they've all been part of our library at one point in time. 
So they now live outside of the state, but they're all part of the NLS. They're all eligible patrons. And so we open it up to those people. And we have always said that it's okay until it becomes a problem. If ever we got too many people, we just couldn't manage that work, that, that number of people, then we may have to reassess it, but it's never been a problem. So essentially anyone who is part of the NLS, even if it were a different state, I would ask that they call us and we can have a conversation. If you are part of the NLS in Massachusetts, then you are guaranteed the service. If you are not part of it, we'll talk about it. You know, I don't want to say, I want to tell people no, but we'll just have a discussion Let's see what we can do. Um, again, the library was created to help people who lost their vision in World War I. We've been changing. We're, we're not here to say no. We're here to help people get access. If you feel that you're eligible and this would be beneficial, talk to me. Uh, also, the telephone programs, uh, people unable to call long distance can be invited with a phone call to join. This was another problem that was uh, addressed um, with this program. I had a number of patrons who were not able to dial out to the, uh, the local number. 646 is the area code. It's a New York number. That's the closest one that we have for Zoom calls. Some patrons, they are on a very limited telephone plan because of their budgetary reasons, and it's, there's no shame in that at all, but they are also having difficulty accessing these materials. So it's, 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 it's a multi-level understanding that we need to be able to reach um, all members of our community. Where are their inabilities to access material? How can we break down those barriers? What accommodations would somebody need? Uh, re there's nothing wrong with reasonable accommodation. That's what we're here for. Um, so finding a way that we can connect those people is paramount. But yeah, the long distance was a concern. So the, to, to address that, what we do now is that if there are any individuals who are not able to join us over the phone by calling in, we bring them out to you. You tell me who you are and I will call you at the beginning of a program, invite you into it. If you're free, great. If you're not, it's okay. Don't answer the phone. Um, but we still want to make those steps available to people. We want to make those accommodations. Uh, the gray digital divide. I talked briefly about this. That's actually misspelled. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. What's the difference between G-R-E-Y and G-R-A-Y? Anyone know? Exactly, yeah. E is the English. A is the American. So if you're ever unsure, if you're ever doubtful about which is, is it A-Y or E-Y? If you're in England, E-Y. If you're American, A-Y. So uh, anyway, um, the digital divide. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, this is a quote, many federal, local, and state governments, in addition to large and small businesses, implemented remote working or distance learning options to help abate the spread of the virus. As those decisions were made, some of the population had the option and the capability to shift activities online while others did not. It's that others did not part, that's the important thing. There were a lot of people that were able to just easily shift online, not a problem at all, I'm well versed with the internet, and there were many people that did not fall into that category, and then they were the ones that were most impacted by this. And oftentimes, as I mentioned, these are the people that were feeling isolated to begin with. The digital divide has been used to characterize a gap between those who have access to telecommunications and information technologies and those who do not. Um, this is from a Congressional Research Service publication. Um, so that's essentially who or how we define the digital divide. Who falls into that? It's a catch-all term though. Many, many people for many, many reasons may have that. I'll give you an example. Um, not so much to do with the digital divide, but in some degree it did. Uh, before we had this machine, this machine that we passed around beforehand, that's a digital player. What we send are physical cartridges that have digital content saved to them, so you don't have to rewind them anymore. Before we did that, we used tapes. There was one instance, and this is, this is on a federal level, there was one instance of a US citizen who was part of our NLS library who was living in Saudi Arabia at the time. He was living in the desert. He was part of our library, but had not the ability to charge his player. So what do we do? Right? You're guaranteed these services. You're guaranteed accessible library materials under our federal law. Right? So what do we do? Well, we actually, you know, I say we, I didn't have anything to do with this. The Library of Congress and the National Library Service actually created a solar powered machine. It was, a, it was an add-on that was sent to this person and they were able to use the sun to charge their player so they were able to read that way. So again, just trying to find ways to think outside the box to bring access and resources to people. There's a lot of community libraries that will do deliveries or they will work with other organizations. And what we do is we supplement resources for libraries. I sometimes feel like I don't want librarians ever to feel like we're trying to muscle in on their territory. That's not what we do. We supplement resources because the fact of the matter is that we are not a front facing agency like that. We have over 27,000 account holders. Most of them have never been to our library in Watertown and they don't need to. 
we mail everything to them. It goes right to their home, which is great, but it's a double-edged sword because again, if you have someone who is already feeling isolated, what does that mean when they have no reason to go into the community? There's a number of libraries I've actually worked with that have acted as a depository for their communities. And so you would have library members, pa patrons of our library, asking us, can you send these books to my public library? Every week I come in and I talk to Judith. She is my librarian. She's amazing. I just, I don't know if there's a Judith here. I just made that up. Uh, but, you know, this is my librarian. And I love coming and talking to her about books and literature. And she gives me recommendations. And I enjoy that very much. And we don't want to take that away. We want them to have access to these resources through whatever means is best for them. And if we can provide them for um, the local library to provide for their local community members, we can't do that. We are not that kind of brick and mortar store. We cannot be that front facing organization, that community provider that librarians and libraries are able to do. So it's important that we also emphasize that um, what we're able to do, it's only supplemental, right? Like we want to provide for our community members, but part of that is also community. And that's something that's really hard to do when we're all the way in Watertown, surrounded by an hour worth of traffic. Uh, the Great Digital Divide constitutes a major challenge for elderly to participate and benefit from the digital revolution. Elderly face problems for basic tasks such as booking tickets or renewing bus cards to claiming old age benefits because most of the systems are digitized. This is again, just to, to, to beat that dead horse, this is a real problem that a lot of people have. And as we are finding more and more things are moving to a digital system. My grandfather, um, he used to do his taxes himself for many and many a year. And then all of a sudden, that's not all available anymore. If you want to do your taxes, you now have to go online to do them. Um, he was a bit stubborn, so he did not want to go to the library. He wanted to do things on his own, so he went and he paid an accountant to do that. And you, know, you do what you have to do. But what had once been a point that he was proud to be able to do on his own, now became something that he was ashamed to have to ask someone else's help for. Immigrant LGBTQ, uh, uh, there, there's, there's more there, excuse me, for the, uh, the missing letters. People are at higher risk. This is an important point. This is originally from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, published in 2021. Current research suggests that immigrant, lesbian, gay, bisexual populations experience loneliness more often than other groups. It's an unfortunate reality. Latino immigrants have fewer social ties and lower levels of social interaction than US born Latinos. Uh, my wife is Portuguese, or she's Brazilian, she speaks Portuguese, um, and it's a reality. There's a lot of organizations that don't realize, I just wrote a paper about this, there's a lot of organizations that don't realize what exactly accessibility can mean. Um, in her instance, she may express to someone that she does not speak English as a first language, Portuguese is her first language and they will refer her to Spanish language resources, thinking that's pretty much the same thing, right? I've had many of people say it's pretty much the same thing, right? It's not, it's not. Uh, and it's painful to have to explain that to people because these are resources that are meant to help people in her exact situation. The reality though is that there's a lot of people that may not look for, far enough into what accessibility means. First generation immigrants experience stressors that can increase their social isolation, such as language barriers, differences in community, familial dis, uh, dynamics, and new relationships that lack depth or history, the report states. So again, going back to this um, uh, CDC report, um, we want to be able to A, address these issues, but B, to bring awareness to them because we can't do everything, right? We want to be able to do everything for our community. And I say we, I mean we as a society. We can't do everything, but we want to be able to help as much as we possibly can. Gay, lesbian, bisexual populations tend to have more loneliness than heterosexual peers because of stigma, discrimination, and barriers to care. Again, we want to be able to address our communities for every member of our community, regardless of some of these concerns. Um, if you're part of a community, then you're part of a community. Loneliness and so, uh, social isolation linked to serious health conditions. More than one third of adults age 45 and older feel lonely and nearly one fourth of adults age 65 and older are considered to be socially isolated. This is from uh, National Acad Academies of Science. Um, older adults are at increased risk of loneliness and social isolation because they are more likely to face factors such as living alone, the loss of family or friends, goodness, that's a reality, uh, chronic illness and hearing loss. So again, these are, these are problems that are not a one-off. These are, these are very, very common. Um, I was at an event um, uh, last year, not this year, I was at an event last year, the MLA conference, 
And uh, I had addressed uh, a couple of different people, a few librarians had come by, and I asked them, do you have any people in your community who have uh, vision loss, some form of vision loss, low vision? And far too many of them, without batting an eye, said, nope, not in our community, none. And I'm like, I, I don't want to call you a liar, but have you asked them? <laughs> like, are, are you sure? Because that's a very, very common occurrence. I work a lot with social, um, social workers, people that go into people's homes, and I, I talk with them. Like, how can you tell if somebody may be eligible for these services? Because the reality is a lot of times people, they don't want to admit that they need help or that they're no longer the same person that they once were, or that they can no longer access materials that they once can. But the reality is that you are. You're still the same person. You can still access the same materials, perhaps just not that same medium. Maybe we need to change the format a little bit, but it's still available to you. And that's what our job is. That's where we come in. So there's a lot of times I'll talk to social workers. I'm like, you go into someone's home. Do they have large print books on their shelf? Do you see them reading large print anymore? Ask them about that. Barbara, I see you have all these books on your shelf, all these low vision books, all these large print books. I don't ever see you reading them anymore. Oh, I read once in a while. I, I just get headaches now. I, I can't read for too long. Um, yeah, my eyes strain, but the lighting is not good in here. All of those reasons, someone can get signed up for our services. I'm going to talk a little bit about who is eligible and what the eligibility means, but essentially, again, going back to that point, if you have a hard time holding a book, turning pages, and reading comfortably for an extended period of time, get in contact with us. Communicate to us, because there's a good chance that we may be able to help. Among Medicare benefits, social isolation is the cause of $6.7 billion, it would be billion dollars in additional health care costs each year. If we can help address these issues, it's going to be a chain effect. Right? Like helping one person can help a lot of people. Bringing awareness to the needs of the community can help all those people who don't have that voice. Advocacy is huge. Understanding is huge. Following up with these points is also huge too. So, uh, health risks of loneliness. Uh, social isolation significantly increased a person's risk of premature death from all causes, a risk that may rival those of smoking, obesity, and physical inactivity. That is huge. That means that you're is equally impacted by smoking as you are as being lonely. This is a report from the National Academies of Sciences. We want to be able to address these issues. We want people to be aware about these issues. So talking about this, this is important. And checking in with your friends and your family, that's also important too. Uh, when COVID happened, I called all the members of my book group. Like, hey, how you doing? You okay? Do you need anything? You need food? I made sure that one of our members was able to get a delivery of their food before everything was shut down. These are the kind of considerations that people don't always think about. One of my favorite quotes, I don't have it here, I posted it on our social media recently. One of my favorite quotes was uh, from um, Mr. Mr. Rogers, uh, when, I'm going to paraphrase and slaughter it, I'm sure, but when uh, catastrophe happens, look for the helpers. Yes. Look for the helpers. Look for the people that are out there because there are many people. And I hope to be a helper. I hope that when the dust settles and people can look at me and they say, he was helping. And I hope that everyone here is also going to be able to do that too. No matter how that may look, that may just be talking to your friend. Hey, did you know about the library? I was just at this event. This crazy guy was up there talking for way too long about the library. Maybe you can get signed up with them. Who knows? Loneliness was associated with higher rates of depression, anxiety, and tragically suicide. A very tragic number of people we lost. Social isolation was associated with about 50% increase of dementia. My grandfather was diagnosed with dementia. He was a loner for most of his life. I did my best. He was a VA member of the VA, did not want to go anywhere. He just wanted to do his own thing by himself. He'd always been that way. Um, he was a remarkable person. He was a National Park Ranger many years ago. And uh, part of his job was to go and sit and live in isolation for about six to eight months in uh, upstate New York in the Adirondacks and just monitor for any fires, uh, keeping track of uh, different data points, amount of rainfall, how dry things were, the wind, stuff like that. But um, it's important that we understand how these conditions could impact people's health later on, including dementia, which is a tragic, tragic condition. Poor social relationships characterized by social isolation or loneliness was associated with a 29% increased risk of heart disease and 32% increased risk of stroke. Who knew? I did not know until I started researching how many actual conditions are linked to something as simple as loneliness. We have the power today to address that. We have the impact. Do you know anyone in your life who's feeling a little lonely? We can make these changes. 
Loneliness among heart failure patients was associated with nearly four times increased risk of death, 68% increased risk of hospitalization, and 57% increased risk of emergency department visits. So again, these are real world stats. These are things that we see and we are, we are trying our best to address. Um, but awareness is super important here. Loneliness is a predictor of functional decline and death. Studies have shown that the number of social contacts and the amount of social engagement are associated with poor health outcomes. That's not a surprise to anyone. Among participants who are older than 60, loneliness was a, pre a predictor of functional decline and death. So again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show another um, graph a little bit, but it's gonna kind of bring that point home on who is being impacted here. Uh, persons with disabilities as an unrecognized population. According to a 2015 University of Oregon study, 13% uh, of the American population aged 45 to 54 have a disability. That's a fairly large population in this country. 23% of those ages 55 to 64 have a disability. That number's jumped up quite a bit. That's almost a quarter of our nation, or a quarter of that population. Uh, between 75 and 84, 45% have a disability. You see the trend here? People 85 and older, 65, sorry, 68% have a disability, some form of disability. That is more than half of people over the age of 85. I'm not gonna call anyone out here, but does anyone here know someone who's over 85? I'm, I'm seeing no hands, all right, that's good. All right, I'm guessing you guys are probably not telling me the truth, but uh, whatever it may be, it's something that we want people to be aware of. Uh, this is from um, American Journal of Public Health uh, from 2015. So you can imagine what that has represented now. Uh, and here's the, 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 the chart that I wanted to illustrate to you. Um, so there are different age groups here, 18 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, 55 to 64, 65 to 74, 75 to 84, and 85 plus. Each graph is broken into two different colors. The white is no disability, and the blue represents a disability. So between 18 and 24, only 6.1% of those individuals have a disability. Now, you'll notice the percentage is pretty much the same. Until you get about 55, then it jumps up to 22.7%. The number starts to drop and decline a little bit. Um, the important one that I like to point out is that 85 and older. 67% have a disability. Notice how the total population in millions is so much smaller compared to like 45, 55. That represents our mortality. As we get older, more and more people may no longer be with us. You know, we hope everyone stays as, with us as long as possible, as long as they'd like to, but um, when you get to be that age though, you have a, a very serious drop in the number of people that are over that age. And yet that population who has a disability, it's higher, it's a higher representation than the other age groups. So it's an important way that we can visualize contextually who is in need of these services. But the other thing to point out though is that there are no age groups that have no disabilities. Not a single one. Every single one of these age groups has at least some percentage of the population who does indeed have a disability. Bringing again awareness to this, talking about this, uh, and shining light to those people who may be impacted. It's crucial, because there's a lot of times people may have an invisible disability. Um, I'm guilty of this myself. If ever I see somebody walking out of a, a, a car that's parked in a handicapped parking space, I find myself doubting, does that person actually deserve to be parked there? Do they have a decal? Do they have a license plate? It's not my job to do that. It's not right to do that either. We hope that everyone's able to do these considerations on their own, but um, the reality is, is that you just don't know. And it's wrong to make those assumptions. So I do my best to try to be mindful about that. Um, there are many people who are impacted by a disability that you would not otherwise know. Yes, ma'am. I was just thinking about, um, I don't know what years that would have been, but how we began to think about the terms that we use to call people and how you know, we wouldn't want to call somebody uh, disabled. Mm -hmm. it's maybe we would rather call them yeah. You know, by another, it's, it's a euphemism. Correct. Thing. And I, you know, there's a lot of that going on now, and even other grander, not talking necessarily about accessibility. Right. Um, I just wonder if, how that is playing out in terms of, you know, getting the message out. It, does that, is it better to paint it prettier or less? So, or 
if we just be safe, I can't see well. If, 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 so to, to reiterate your, your point was that um, there's a lot of language that we're using now. Language is always updating itself. We're always finding new ways that it's used and ways that we don't want to use it. Um, and there are certain terms which have been considered offensive, and we would try to avoid using those terms. Um, Could you remind us of what those might be? So just to, to uh, I want to talk a little bit more about that, but to specifically to your point, though, um, we try to put people first language out there. Mm -hmm. So I don't say um, this disabled person. Mm -hmm. I say this person with a disability. Right. They're a person first. That's yeah. right. Now, there are, the reality is, is that I don't know what people are going to be offended by. Mm -hmm. I try my best to avoid offending people, but you just don't know. I'll give you an example of this. Um, if I'm talking to my director who has vision loss and I say to her, I'll see you tomorrow. She doesn't take offense to that. And she, I've had a conversation with her before because she's given me a lot of feedback that's been really helpful in understanding how we can best provide care for people. And the important thing is respect. Yeah. I don't say something to disrespect someone. I say something because I want to communicate to that person. And I want to treat them equally. And I use that same language that I use to anyone. Could that language be considered offensive? Yes, the reality is. But there are many things that could be considered offensive to people. I do my best not to offend someone, but I cannot just change what I'm doing because I don't want to step on someone's toes or to inadvertently hurt someone's feelings. But we want to make a combination. Yes, ma'am. I think it's that prefix, dis, when you're putting the dis in front of it. If that was one of the ones that yeah. to be, I mean, we're using it now and you're putting it in a context that makes a lot of sense, but I just am flashing back on those, I was a teacher back in those mm -hmm, days, right? mm -hmm. that was coming around, and I just you know, remember it as being kind of, wow, you know. So I have, used, I have used the term differently abled mm -hmm. and was told that was offensive. Oh, because of the word different? Yeah. Okay, too different. Precisely, yeah. So. Except, except why is different bad? Different could be I want to be good. I could not tell why someone would be offended by something. Yeah. All that I can tell is that I don't want them to feel offended by it. Right. If I should inadvertently offend someone, what I want them to understand though is that that was not intended. Right. I'll give you an example. I was at a conference one time and I had a person approach me and they were trying to introduce themselves. This was a specific conference for people who had disabilities, a wide range of disabilities. This particular person was in a wheelchair and they had difficulty speaking. Um, this person, I was trying to hear what their name was. They were trying to tell me what their name was, and I did not understand. This person, while they may have presented more as a male, they, represent, they presented them, or they uh, self-represented as a woman. And when I was trying to hear their name in my head, I'm like, Daniel, Danny, Donald? What? I, I'm not feeling it. It was not their name. I think it was Deborah, if, I'm, if my memory serves me correctly. But I had no idea, and I was mortified when I realized my mistake. Um, can I do anything to change that? <coughs> no, I can't. I, there's nothing I can really do to stop someone after the fact. Um, but I can represent, though, the best that I possibly can moving forward and try to explain to them that was not my intention, my sincere apologies. What can I do to rectify that? What would you like to be referred to as? I think we have to teach people that and emphasize that second part of it that you're bringing up because most people don't want to hurt other people's no, feelings. No, not at all. They may misspeak because uh, they didn't weren't aware they're ignorant of that particular yeah. issue. Blah, blah, blah. My, name, my name is Aaron. Give people the benefit of this. My name is Aaron. It's E-R-I-N. Mm -hmm. It's a Celtic Irish name. Mm -hmm. I've been misgendered more times than I could possibly imagine. I take no offense to that in the slightest. That's just me. That's just me. I cannot speak for other people. And I've had many a times people be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And they will follow themselves backwards trying to apologize to me. It's like, don't worry. It's okay. Like this, I didn't pick my name. My mother did. My mother passed away when I was very young. I had an opportunity to change my name when I was younger. I had really no intention of doing so because my mother gave me that name. She gave it to me for a reason. So I don't take offense to these things. Some people may, but I don't want to live my life walking on eggshells worried about offending someone. Is that my intention? Not at all. If I happen to offend someone, I hope that they can express that to me because I will do my best to try to re remedy that. Right. But you've raised a very good point, though, and I thank you for that. Did I answer your question? I think so. It's just that you have to kind of discuss it and, as a teacher. You know, when you hear these 
kind of thing to be somebody's response, their response. You have to know how to manage it in a way, and by talking about yep. it, and, and I think putting your own honesty out there and saying, well, gosh, I'm sorry, I didn't yeah. to. We're all human, and anyone who thinks otherwise, well, I'd question them. Um, but one thing that I do like to point out, and I wish I could remember it, I found this term a while back, and I cannot find it again, but there was a term specifically uh, denoting words and language which had at one point in time been accessible or acceptable and have since fallen out of favor because of modern-day um, uh, uh, intentions. So the R word. You guys may be familiar. I don't want to say it. R-E-T. I'm not going to go too much farther than that. I don't want to offend anyone. That word had been a clinical term. A-R-D. Sorry, okay, forgive me. I didn't, I didn't want to, 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 to give too much information. But yes, yes, so retard. Yes, so that is correct, yes. And that had at one point in time been a clinical term to describe yes. someone with a mental deficiency. However, that term is no longer considered acceptable. Yeah. There are many organizations and people that I've heard use that term, perhaps unintentionally, not meaning to be offended or anything, but the reality is, is that it could be construed as such. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're talking about a material that is flame retarded, mm -hmm. that's not really intended to be offended. Mm -hmm. But you never really know. And just being accommodating, being understanding to people, and being aware about where someone may have issue with certain words and, and usage, that's the important thing, at least from my perspective. Mm -hmm. But perhaps there are other people that may have a different policy. Yeah. You know, So I don't know what your principal or your superintendent or your uh, governing body would have an opinion on that. Perhaps you guys have a dictionary of words. You say, you're not, we're trying not to use these words. Um, as an information professional, I don't like the idea about curtailing speech or preventing people yeah. from using words. If you feel like that's the appropriate word to use, then I feel like that's acceptable. But understand, though, words do have impact. And if you're using a word because you want to get an emotional response out of somebody, be prepared. Sometimes you get more response than you realize. Uh, what else does the Perkins Library offer? I wanted to bring us a little bit back more on message here. Um, what we provide are audio books, braille books, large print books, audio magazines, audio described movies, Bard app, and iOS for Android device or for iOS and Android devices, Newsline talking newspaper service, and Library Without Walls. Um, there's a lot of different things that we're able to provide for our patrons. The audio books are what we're most known for. It's our bread and butter. Um, so an audio book would arrive in the mail in one of these containers. So. Let me open it up. There are two tabs on the top. I'm going to lift them up next to the microphone. There's one. There's two. So those two tabs, I open it up. I can then open the container like a clamshell. Inside of it, let me just dump it out. It's a talking book right here. Boom. It's hard plastic. You don't have to worry about breaking them. Um, somebody did take a screwdriver one of these because they wanted to see what was inside of it, and it, it broke it. So it's like, don't do that. If you want to know what's inside it, I'll tell you. It's essentially just a USB thumb drive wrapped in hard plastic. Um, we have a new system which is phenomenal. This is outstanding. What time is it? How much time have we got? I don't want, I don't want to keep you guys. Oh, it's 4 o'clock. What time are we going to go until? 4. All right. If you've got to leave, it's OK. But if you, if you want to know a little bit more, I can help answer questions and things like that. Um, so we use this new system called duplication on demand. And this is phenomenal about what our library is able to do. Um, it, the old system meant that if somebody were to call us and say, I want to read everything Daniel Steele's ever written. Send it to me. Send everything that Daniel still has ever written. We'd send them a stack of these containers, each one containing a book saved on one of these cartridges. This was really inefficient, though. Part of the reason why this program is so popular is because it's not a digital uh, system. This is a physical system. What that means, though, is that we have to transport materials physically to the patron. So if somebody said, I want to read 100 books, then they would get 100 cartridges. And that's not really that efficient, especially since we can do so much more. So the new system, duplication on demand, would see us you want to read everything Daniel Steele wrote? Boom, here you go. One cartridge, everything that you need, right here. When you're done with it, you put it back in the mailing container, you flip the address card over, you put it back in the mail, it comes back to us. No cost for any postage. Wow. The point that I try to make to people, though, is that just because something's free doesn't mean it's without cost. So even though it doesn't cost the patron anything to use these services, there is inherently uh, an expense for the materials, for the labor, for the infrastructure, for our environment. All of these things are being utilized in order to provide these materials. And we are so proud to be able to do that. But as part of a state agency, it's important that we also recognize how can we find ways to make our services more accessible and more sustainable. So the new system allows us to take multiple copies on one cartridge. And instead of sending somebody 100 containers, we can send them one container. Yeah. And that's going to make it that much easier for all of those services that we're utilizing. 
So the uh, duplication of demand is an amazing program. And one thing that I like to point out to people is that we're one of the few institutions in the country, the only one that I know of, that actually has permission on a federal level to violate copyright law. <laughs> Let me give you an example of this. Let's say that your public library wanted to um, have a book group, right? even an audio book group. We have a low vision book group at our library. I, I run the largest low vision book group in New England that I know of. Um, Let's say that we wanted to read a particular book and we had you know, uh, 18 copies on the shelf and 20 people wanted to read it. Well, that means that two people aren't gonna be able to read that book. Sorry, you out of luck, first come, first serve. That's not fair, we don't wanna do that. So what we can actually do is we can just make copies. That's what the DOD allows us to do. So it doesn't matter you know, who has the physical copy, it doesn't matter. We can just make digital copies of these titles. As long as somebody's part of our library, then we're actually able to do an awful lot. So everyone can get their own customized cartridge because of these federal permissions that we have on that level. Um, so as long as the materials are meant for someone who's eligible for us, then we can do an awful, awful lot. Um, let's see, what else I want to talk about? Braille, we have over eight miles of printed Braille at our library. If we were to stack it all end to end, we have an enormous collection. That doesn't even include the digital Braille. Uh, large print books, enormous. We have so many large print books, we can't even keep them in Watertown. We have to keep them in central Massachusetts. So if that gives you an idea, your library may have tons and tons of them. There's a good chance we may have a few more. Um, audio magazines, audio described movies. Again, your public library may have DVDs here as well, but do they denote that some of them have audio description or not? I don't know, but all of the movies in our collection have audio description. Audio description essentially is a narrator who comes on and speaks in between the lines of dialogue to describe what's happening visually on the screen. So you don't need to be able to see the screen in order to watch it and enjoy it. And that's part of the reason why the materials over the telephone are so uh, readily available. Yes, ma'am. I, mean, I just had a question um, about how many people are actually using Braille books these days. Uh -huh. And then a follow-up question in my head, can you give a kind of rough estimate of what the main, uh, what, you know, like how these write? Like, oh, like popularity? Yeah, like are, are there a lot of Braille readers these days, or is that kind of down, down the list a little bit now that there's all the... That's a great question. So I had said before that the number one reason why people are eligible is often because of age-related vision loss. Most people who are part of our library lose their vision after they've retired, mm -hmm. in which case they don't feel the need to learn Braille. For people who are younger, thankfully we've come a long way with our medical, oh, excuse me, forgive me. So for anyone that didn't hear the question, she was asking about braille usage and where these stack up as far as popularity goes. So as braille usage goes for our senior population, they typically do not know to read braille. Um, for our younger people, there is fewer and fewer people who start off life with vision loss, graciously. There are many nations though that don't yet have those medical advancements like what we have in the United States. So um, you'll find out a larger population of younger people who are learning Braille. Braille is the most important thing. If you have a student, and I cannot stress this enough, if you have a student who has vision loss, please put a lot of understanding in the importance of learning Braille. Braille does not only allow people to absorb information, but also to convey information to others. It's a, it's a form of communication. I can listen to everything, but to be able to communicate that to others, that's the challenge. If I wanted to spell a word to someone, would I know how to spell it if I've only ever heard the word read aloud? Do I know what the alphabet is? These are real problems that teachers and TVIs may need to address with their uh, students and with the parents of these students. How is information accessible? I had a woman, I'll tell you a quick, I love telling stories, so forgive me. Again, if you gotta leave, it's okay. Um, I had a woman one time, she was uh, um, diagnosed with um, vision loss later on in life. She called me because she said, well, I, I was diagnosed I went and I had a surgery that restored my vision. However, they say within six to eight months, I'm going to lose my vision again, and there's nothing they can do after that. This is it. This is all that I got. Mm -hmm. I want to take this time to learn Braille because I love to read, and I want to continue to read, and I understand that Braille would help me to do so. And I had a conversation with this person. And again, I'm not a medical professional, but I am here to just kind of outline what the options are and let them make those decisions. And I asked her, I says, with your last six or eight months of vision, do you want to sit reading or do you want to do something else with that? And she called me the next day and she said, I, I, my husband and I, we had a conversation and I would like to try the audiobooks. We're going to go and visit Europe because we've always wanted to go. And while I've got my vision, that's what I want to do with it. And I support that. If she wanted to learn Braille, I'd support that too. Because that could be beneficial to her. Are there other options? Yes. Are there better options than Braille? Eh, that's debatable. Braille is honestly one of the most important things you can provide to a student. Employability is huge. I don't have the stats here, but um, there is an enormous population of people who have a disability who are not gainfully employed. 
that's a challenge. That's a real challenge. And we want to be able to provide some of the best resources and tools to help prevent that from happening because independence and self-sufficiency is paramount. We want people to be self-sufficient and to feel as though they can do things on their own. And having the ability to read Braille is crucial, absolutely crucial. I've got some Braille examples, um, which I can leave with you guys too. If anyone wants to learn more about Braille, maybe I can give you a very, very quick crash course. But moving right along, digital magnification. Uh, this is super, super important for a lot of people who have low vision, but it doesn't help anyone who has no vision, right? So if you're unable to see at all, then magnification is not gonna help you. But magnification could sometimes be outside of someone's reasonable uh, capability of, of purchasing, right? So I often say if somebody has a choice between buying assistive technology or paying for the medical bills, that's a tough choice. Our library lends out equipment. People donate equipment to us because it's like, you know, my mother had it, I can no longer use it. Um, is there anyone that you know of who can use it? Probably, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people, they reach out to us to donate equipment and to borrow equipment too. So if you know of anyone who could use this, let us know. If you know anyone who has equipment, I always say contact your local public library, contact your council on aging, see if they could use it first because they're a bit closer and we don't provide it for institutions. We only provide it for end users. Institutions theoretically would be able to purchase their own. So this is a handheld magnifier. I know it looks really big, but it's not. Um, this is a standard uh, magnification and that one right there is uh, an advanced machine. That has OCR and um, TTS capabilities. OCR is optical character recognition and TTS is text to speech. So essentially what that means is that the system would take a picture of printed text using a database of recognizable characters would be able to uh, digitize that image into editable text and then using TTS, text to speech, it could read that text aloud. So if you've ever been in a car, if you yourself has ever used GPS, that GPS voice is not actually reading to you from a script. Those are just digitized voices. So it could be of anything. Uh, and so that's the technology which is being utilized here. This is my favorite. This is a very, very low tech piece of equipment. That's a scanner bin. Um, essentially, it's just a box. Nothing else special about it. Uh, but you'll notice right next to it is a smartphone. I've had many a times, I'll go and I'll talk to someone, I'll talk to an organization, they ask me, what is the best thing? Like, what, if I was to get only one thing for my mother to make things more accessible, what would be the best thing to provide? My answer typically is the ubiquitous smartphone. They're very easy to get hold of. You can get an Android phone for less than $100. Many places you can get them for free. Uh, and you can install apps on them that can make them an incredibly powerful resource. I have on my phone an app that I can just take, I think I may have shown it. I have an app on my phone, I can take a picture of a business card and it will digitize it. And with one tap, I can call the person now. So how can we represent information in an accessible format? Print is great. You may have seen something else too. I get this question all the time. Sim Braille, simulated Braille, you ever heard that? That's like where Braille is printed on paper. Like it looks like Braille, you know that it's Braille but it's only simulation of Braille. Braille needs to be raised in order to be accessible, so it's not accessible. So how content is presented can really differentiate how material can be accessed. Understanding how somebody can find something accessible or inaccessible is paramount. We talked about it before, but again, just to reiterate it, Braille is accessible, but only if you can read Braille. Large print is accessible, but only if you can read or have some vision. So there are ways that things can be made inaccessible. Um, accessible games. Uh, gamification, I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about some of the games that are here. I brought a few examples along with me here um, about what games are and what accessibility could mean. So on the screen here, on the upper left-hand corner, there is a picture of an accessible chessboard. You may notice from the image here that the uh, white pieces have a little centered uh, 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 divot on the top, uh, and that differentiates from the black pieces. So the black pieces don't have that. So if somebody had some vision, then they have high contrast colors, black versus white. If someone had no vision, they have tactile features. So you may also notice, it's kind of hard to see, but the black pieces and the white pieces are slightly different. They use the CNC machine in order to etch out those individual squares. So if you were to put your hand over that board, you can feel which ones are the black squares and which ones are the white squares. Uh, to the right here, this was an image. This was actually taken at the Care Memorial Library. They did a game night that we made it more accessible and inclusive. So that image shows, um, well, A, number one, the bills are actually quite accessible. They are high contrast colors. Thank you so much for coming. Um, the, uh, the property value here, these are huge. And they also have Braille, so that's large print and Braille, so very accessible. You may also notice the uh, chance and the community chess uh, 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 cards, massive. They're, they're massive, they're bigger than an index card. Um, so for that instance, we had a, 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 a couple that had come in and the uh, husband who had vision loss turns to his wife and he says, you won't be able to cheat now. <laughs> but we want to be able to do that. We want to be able to provide accessibility and for have that independence. 
On the lower left-hand corner is a die that I had produced. It's just a normal six-sided die. Um, but this one's kind of hard to see, but they have raised dots. So regardless of someone's ability to see the die or not, you can still feel and count them up. I've got a couple examples here I'll show you guys too. And to the right of that, we have uh, Uno cards in Braille. But again, if you can't read Braille, that's not an accessible game. We have these cards here. They're large, massive. Um, these would be accessible for someone with uh, low vision. If someone had no vision, not accessible at all. It doesn't matter how big the cards are. They could be three times as big as that. It won't be helpful to them. Uh, I'm going to leave these on the table. I'll describe it though. If anyone wants to come up and take it, you can uh, take a look. Um, this is one of my favorite games, um, Ludo. Um, I've heard it described as other different things. I think Sorry is another name that I've heard before. Um, but these pieces are meant to be accessible, but they're not tactile enough. And you'll, you'll see this. I'll, I'll leave this out. You can come take a look if you want. But you can't feel the top anymore. You can't feel the difference. Each piece has its own different color and its own different symbol. But the symbol is so embedded in, and they put like a gloss over it, so you can't really feel it. So even though they made accommodations, they did their best, it's really not that accessible. So they did their best. They made an effort. But the fact is that it could be done a little bit differently. Um, and also have the Uno deck. And there's one other thing I wanted to show. Ah, here we go. Uh, this is a uh, tactile Rubik's Cube, and I'll also leave this up here on the table. Um, but for someone who can't see, this game would be accessible because it's using tactile features. The orange has three dots, the red has a line, blue has an X, green has a single dot, um, and the white is nothing. So um, this is an accessible tactile game that someone could play who doesn't need to know how to read Braille or to have any vision. So tactile features are perhaps the most accessible. Um, and we're coming to the very end here. Oh, Talkie and the Talking Book Player. That's the Talking Book Player. I always like to showcase this because um, I find it to be really helpful as a talking point for people. We want people to ask questions. What is the player? What is it that you do? Who is this for? You know, these are important conversations to bring awareness to people because a lot of times people that hear Perkins and in their head they're thinking the school. They think about the students. I'm not a student. I never was a student. I don't live in Watertown. I'm nowhere near Watertown. The library is not for me, and that's not the case. That's not the case at all. Fake news, we want people to be aware about what we're able to do. So having access to information in an accessible format is crucial, but having awareness about that information is even more crucial. Uh, lastly, I wanted to talk to you a little bit more. I've got a couple of these uh, as well with me. Amsler grid cards and the um, Braille alphabet cards. If you want any of these, I'm gonna have them on the table. Um, screen reading freeware, I'm not going to cover too much of this, but if you want to use um, assistive software, take a picture of your screen right now because this is helpful. They're all free. Uh, NVDA or non-visual desktop access is a fairly um, uh, amazing program that can be run off of a thumb drive. Um, there's also JAWS, which is a paid program. These are all free. Apple VoiceOver for Apple and Orca with Linux, and they have the web-based systems as well. So. Um, if you are someone who could use uh, additional um, uh, accessibility, uh, screen reading software can be very expensive, but there are free options as well, and so these are some of them. Um, how to register, you go here if you want to get registered, I can help you out today. I brought some applications, but um, all this information is available on our website, so if you have any questions, um, if you want to get signed up, um, the library here can help people, but if you want to um, uh, work with your local community, we can also talk about that too. Um, lastly, any questions and answers? I know we kind of did that throughout. Um, did anyone have anything? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I mean, I've got kind of a range of questions going on. This is sort of from a perspective of working at a library. Um, but I'm wondering what your, what your selection of audio, of, well, most specifically large benches like, but also audio books. And I'm partially asking that because I know a lot of books never get published in large print editions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, great question. Thank you guys for coming. Um, so, and I just realized I forgot to answer your other question about the, the, the way things are, uh, the, the popularity of accessible resources. I think that was you, or maybe it was you that asked. It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll do my best. Um, but yeah, so more material is available in an audio format than there is in a large print format, in my opinion. Um, what we have available in the country, we will add to our collection. If we don't have it, there's a good chance it's not available. There is an unfortunate number of people, though, that have a harder time 
understanding that not everything is going to be made accessible. Um, you'll have a lot of times people saying, I read a book 60 years ago when I was a teenager. It was like a pulp story. Do you guys have that? Probably not. Sorry. I wish that we could. I wish we could have everything that was available. Well, usually what I will tell people is that um, I will do my best to keep expectations in check. Right? Like I don't want to promise them the moon because I can't deliver that. But I can tell them that while we may not have exactly the title that you're looking for, I'm very positive we'll have something along those lines. We'll have something that's a similar genre, a topic, a subject, um, even an author maybe. But to be able to fulfill every single need, that's a challenge. Our Braille collection, uh, sorry, our large print collection is massive. But do we have everything? No. The fact is that we also don't have everything in an audio format either. We have some materials. It's different now with the DOD system. It used to be when we did the one book per cartridge, we did not oftentimes even have classics. Like somebody called me and they, they were like, I want to read Moby Dick. I was like, you got it. I'm transferred over to a librarian right now, and I transfer. I, I don't do that. I'm, I'm the outreach coordinator. I don't. I'm, uh, I'm working on it. But um, so I transferred over to our uh, one of one of our reader advisors, and they explained to me like, well, we don't have Moby Dick. I'm sorry. I'm like, how do you not have Moby Dick? Like, that's classic. And like, yeah, a lot of the classics people just don't read them. They're not as popular as like some of the, uh, you know, the Daniel Steele, the Stephen King. You know, that type of literature is a bit more approachable for people. So they may not have some of the classics. The new system's different though. So the new system, we could just make duplications. If so, as long as we have something electronically available, then we can make copy of it. Um, but what it, that had translated to is that people using the app had more material than people using the cartridges. The new system, it's a moot point, no longer is an issue. Um, to your first question though about our size of our collection, we have an online public access catalog, an OPAC for those of you who are curious. Um, the OPAC is available for anyone, regardless of whether you're part of our library or not. So oftentimes I'll recommend to people if you know someone, if you yourself would like to get signed up with us, but you're not sure what we have available, check out the catalog. Search and see what we got. We're not here to surprise them. It's all publicly available. If you want to get signed up with us, we're here to do that. If you need help getting signed up, I'm here to do that. So the web address is Perkins, P-E-R-K-I-N-S dot Kloss. K-L-A-S dot com, C-O-M. And that's to our online public access catalog. You can also find this by going to our library's main website, which is perkinslibrary.org. If you'd like to apply online, you can go to perkinslibrary.org forward slash apply. So it's all meant to be fairly uh, easy for people to access. Um, to the question about the popularity of things, the audiobooks are probably the most popular item followed by the large print materials. I would probably say below that we would have either between Braille or the audio described DVDs. Um, the audio described collection is massive. Um, but essentially anytime that something's made available then we would add it to our collection. Something else I wanted to point out to you guys is, is uh, live theater and film. Um, so if you like live theater, I'll, um, in Watertown actually I was just recently added to the um, new rep theater board of uh, directors um, to help them with understanding how their community could be better served by having accommodation for people with disabilities. So um, we want people to be aware, we want people to be asking these questions, um, and we want organizations which are making these accommodations to be recognized for that. Um, Not Your Average Joe's has a couple of different restaurants and they will produce a braille menu as well as a large print menu for those individuals. Now I don't read braille but I'm involved in the production of it though. And as a point I will not only refer people to that restaurant just for that reason, even if they don't need it, but I will say, like, where's a good place to eat? Number one, they got amazing food, but number two, they're also very accommodating. And I like to point that out to people. If you go there, ask them, hey, you guys have a Braille menu? No, I don't need it, but thank you. Thank you so much. I know someone that, that could use that, and I'll make sure to mention that to them. And those kind of uh, considerations, we want to support those organizations. We want to encourage those organizations. When the library is doing an event and it's inclusive, it's accessible, try to be there. Try to show support because that's important. We live off of data. We live off of numbers. And it's important that people are being represented. And there's a lot of people that they may not have a voice. So it's important that we do that. We used to have an event called the Blind Legislative Day uh, in Massachusetts. And we would actually coordinate a whole legislative uh, uh, day at our capital to bring people's awareness to these services and these concerns. Um, we've not been able to do that because of COVID regulations, but we're hoping to be able to resume that soon. But that kind of outreach is important. That kind of information is important to share with people. Any other questions? Yes. Do you see the drop off in the um, requests for your any of that assistive um, technology that you were talking about now that people do have 
have smartphones and they can do apps on their own? No. You seen no. That I wish. I wish. Um, I'm, I'm guessing in the near future, the population that we're mostly dealing with are people that have never used smartphones, smart devices, smart technology. Exactly, yeah. For younger people, it's, they don't need that technology. They don't need a machine that's only dedicated for magnifying because I can use my tablet and I can do essentially the same thing. But if somebody's not familiar with um, a touch screen, and when I say that, I mean assistive access. So there is voiceover for Apple and, and Google products where you don't need to use the touch screen. But a lot of times, people, that's a mental barrier. Like, I can't use a touch screen. Well, you can, but there is a learning curve. Same thing with the telephone. I cannot tell you how many times somebody has contacted us and said, I have just lost my vision. I can no longer use the phone. I can't even dial you guys. I, need, I can't do it. I need help. And oftentimes it can be very overwhelming. But the reality is that we have measures that are in place and we can help. We can work at understanding more. Every phone that's produced here, at least in this country, um, the center button five has a little dip on it on the top. It's true for all phones. It doesn't matter whatever phone it is. When you get home and you've got a touch phone, look for that. Every button phone has a five right in the center. From there, you can work outward. So I know five is in the middle. That means that two is on the top, eight is on the bottom, uh, what is it, four on the left, and six on the right. And from there, I can work outward. One, the corner, three, the corner, seven, the corner, nine, the corner, zero is below the eight. So um, it's feasible for someone to learn these things, but it's often a mental barrier that people have. It's not, a, it's not an actual barrier, it's just something that's, I can't do this because they've not tried to do it. And I understand and I'm very sympathetic of those situations, but if somebody is interested in learning, if they want to go down that road and they want to explore what other options are available, we can do that. Great question. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm just wondering who was the person with the new Perkins? Oh, uh, I try and remember the rest of his name. He had donated the, uh, the original school to the institute, and so the institution was named after him. Uh, and then that uh, original institution was then sold, and the current location we're at right now was purchased with those monies. So um, oftentimes people are familiar with Helen Keller and Sullivan. Oh. Helen Keller actually did not attend the school that we currently exist at right now. She was part of the original school, but she did visit the current school that we're at right now, and frankly we grew um, because it was necessary. Uh, Watertown doesn't have a lot of growth beyond that, though. It's kind of a tight-knit uh, area to begin with, but um, that's how we got there. Um, so Samuel Gridley Howe was the first president of the campus, and he had um, uh, been uh, the, the, the main building on the campus is the Howe Building. So if you've ever been to the campus, which I hope everyone gets a chance to, uh, definitely check it out. Um, but the, the bell tower is essentially the Samuel Gridley uh, uh, Howe Building. Can we plan a field trip? If you wanted to, yeah. In fact, if you call me, I could be more than happy. I can take you on a quick tour. It'd be no problem at all. Pick up uh, the delivery, right? <laughs> say it again? Pick up the delivery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could do that. Um, any other questions? We, we went a little bit over, but I think we covered a lot today. I really appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. I have another question. I heard a book, I had a book being read to me when I was driving out to, uh, I wasn't driving, but I was in the car driving with my brother. Uh -huh. And he's listening to one of those books. And can you drive and listen to a book at the yeah. same time? Absolutely. Safely? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, I, while I don't have any vision loss, I do like to uh, convert all of my school notes and readings to an audio format, which I find to be more accessible, um, partially because I can do other things while I'm doing that. So I can be on the treadmill, I could be driving, I could be doing... Multitasker. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, any number of things. I just, it's not always healthy, but you know, some people's heads are wired like that. But uh, it's hard to focus on just one thing sometimes. But yeah, there's a lot of people that do just that. So there's nothing wrong with that. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys so thank very you. much. This is wonderful. Thank you.